Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. In just a minute, I'll be thrilled to roll out this week's seminar with Hannes Pickler. I'm really excited to have Hannes here. Um, now, before we bring Hannes onto the stage, allow us to give everyone just a minute or two to tune into the live stream. Now, usually I like to ask people, where are you tuning in from today? And I can already see that folks have learned uh, my favorite question. And I see folks from Chicago, the Netherlands, Sofia, Bulgaria, um, Santa Barbara, Hello Kelly, India, Taiwan. So as usual, it's such an impressive and amazing group of folks from all over the world. You can post where you're tuning in from in the comment chat box. But today I also have a more special question. This is our 99th Kiskit Quantum Seminar. Next Friday, we have an incredibly special 100th Kiskit Quantum Seminar. And I would personally love to know some of the stories that you guys have had and experienced with this seminar series. We're writing up a little piece and we'd love to know and some of your shares on how has the seminar been impactful in your own life and world? Has it perhaps helped you come up with new research ideas, new research collaborations, perhaps learn and find out what PhD to go do, as I heard from some folks, or a new group? Um, you'd love to, to hear and share how it's been impactful, meaningful, useful to you. So feel free to post that in the comment chat box, which is located here on YouTube, above, below, left or right, somewhere on the screen. I'm sure you can find it. It's the same place where you can ask questions of Hannes, the speaker, and myself during this. You can also discuss in chat. Or if you want to private message me or DM me on LinkedIn or Twitter, whichever of those, we'd love to hear your experience with the Kiskit seminar and stories that go along with it. It's been a lot of fun for us doing 100 seminars uh, since the start of COVID is uh, even has taken us even further than we thought. So to me, this and the next one are very special, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Without further ado, I think it's time we begin. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series, number 99, dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the very special pleasure and privilege of hosting Hannes Pichler from the University of Innsbruck and the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum information, who will speak on entanglement optimal trajectories of many body quantum Markov processes. Before we bring Hannes here to the stage, uh, Hannes uh, has a very beautiful long bio. I'll give it you the short version. Hannes studied at the University of Innsbruck and received his PhD with Peter Zoller. From 2016 to 2019, Hannes was at Harvard as an ITEM postdoc fellow, which is where I had the pleasure of meeting him. And then he went on to Caltech as a Gordon Bettymore postdoc fellow. Since uh, 2020, Hannes has joined as a professor at the University of Innsbruck and as a working group leader at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. Now, just a few weeks ago, Hannes had a very special uh, event also happen. He was awarded the prestigious New Horizons Physics Prize, uh, awarded at the Breakthrough Prize Ceremony, which is considered, I think, the world's uh, highest endowed prize overall. And I had the pleasure to congratulate Hannes in person at KITP. So with that, Hannes, it's a real pleasure to have you. How are you today? Hi, Zlatko. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. OK, perfect, perfect. I'm doing fine. I hope you do fine, too. So, Great. Uh, and let me. Before Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Let me just thank you for you know giving me the opportunity to present here at this, this seminar series. I think what you're doing here with this series is really a fantastic service uh, you know to the community. And and I'm really glad that I you know can you know tell you something about the work I've been doing in recent times with, with some of my students. So should I just uh, go ahead and start? The pleasure is ours. Hannes, the stage is yours. OK, perfect. Thank you. Uh, OK, so what I would like to do today is to tell you about the project that I've done together with uh, my student, Tatiana Wolfk, uh, where we studied properties of you know, quantum trajectories. 
And uh, one of the reasons why I'm excited to tell you this today is because I know the host Slatko has a very sort of special history with quantum trajectories. He has done so many beautiful things with uh, quantum uh, trajectories and experiments. So I hope you know he in particular appreciates you know the topic of the talk today. Uh, okay, so with that, I'll just start and uh, sort of set the stage a little bit. So what I'm what I'm going to be interested in this talk is uh, you know methods to solve uh, for the dynamics of quantum many-body systems uh, if they're noisy. Okay, and what I mean by solving is really like using a classical computer uh, to solve for the dynamics of a noisy you know intermediate scale quantum uh, system. And uh, so my background is quantum optics. So when I think about you know NISC devices or noisy systems in general, what I uh, do is I write down a master equation, uh, you know, like this one here, uh, which uh, you know describes the dynamics of the density operator of your system, which is you know maybe a many-body system, and uh, you know has a Hamiltonian uh, who's you know governing the coherent dynamics of this many-body system. As a set of jump operators that you know describe the coupling to the environment with associate decay rates. Okay, and uh, the idea here is that, of course, all of us know that you know studying you know, representing the dynamics of a purely coherent uh, quantum many-body system where the where all of these you know decay rates would be zero and you would only have this coherent part in using the dynamics is is very hard. Okay, that's uh, you know why we're building you know quantum uh, computers in some sense uh, but uh, what what I would like to see is if we can you know make use of the noise that is there in your know, current experiments uh, to actually you know make the simulation on classical systems on classical machines um, more efficient okay so that's that's kind of my goal for for this talk and uh, you know this is kind of like a you know, pictorial representation of what I have in mind. So this is my many-body system that is coupled to my environment. And you know, in general, it's really sort of a many-body system that is coupled to multiple you know environments, uh, which is really sort of what underlies this this kind of mass equation. The way uh, I write it down here. Uh, okay, so um, you know, given that, let me just sort of start. When I write down this uh, master equation, right, what I really have in mind is a quantum optical model uh, that underlies this master equation in the following sense. I can write down uh, a Schrodinger equation for a pure state, uh, where the pure state is really the wave function of, you know, the joint system uh, of sort of the system of interest and all the, you know, environment degrees of freedom. So you know the entire system is of course you know closed and therefore you know obeys uh, you know unitary Schrodinger equation. And uh, you know what I typically write down is a Hamiltonian that is you know the full Hamiltonian of the system and the, the bath degrees of freedom, uh, which contains you know the system Hamiltonian, which is the coherent part you know of the system alone. Uh, it contains uh, a, bath a bath Hamiltonian, which you know we you know write down in the following way. We just assume that each of these you know paths uh, is just a collection of harmonic oscillator harmonic oscillators, which uh, you know are all described uh, by by this you know very standard Hamiltonian. So we have uh, you know bosonic creation and annihilation operator at sort of frequency omega. Uh, they have an energy, you know, omega, and uh, you know we, they satisfy standard bosonic limitation relation. And uh, what we will assume in the following is that the initial state of the environment is such that it's it they, they, all of the environment modes are in the vacuum. So uh, this bosonic, uh, you know, operator of each of these environment modes annihilates the state in the vacuum. Okay, and I mean, this is a very sort of simple standard uh, way to write down an environment in quantum optics. And then we write down an interaction between the system and the environment. And the way we write it down is uh, we, uh, you know, write down this sort of coupling Hamiltonian that, you know, describes 
very often the interaction of quantum optical systems with their environment. If you make, for example, a rotating wave approximation and some sort of approximation about sort of the, the, the bandwidth over which you couple to the environment, you can write down this, this coupling Hamiltonian, which basically contains the jump operator of the system uh, in combination with the creation operator of a bosonic mode in the corresponding environment. And uh, you know, from quantum optics, we know that you know if you write down this Hamiltonian and the corresponding Schrodinger equation, you can now exactly sort of trace out uh, the environment degrees of freedom. So if you assume they're initially at time zero, all in in the vacuum state of the corresponding sort of harmonic oscillators here, then uh, you can derive the equation of motion for the you know reduced density operator of the system alone. And it's indeed the master equation that you know I wanted to solve uh, in the first place. So this is for me kind of where this master equation comes from. And uh, this is kind of the starting point. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, let me just uh, change the frame a little bit. I'm still talking about this, this uh, Hamiltonian and this system bar interaction. But uh, what I want to do is I want to now go into an interaction picture with the Bath Hamiltonian. Okay, I make a unitary transformation with this Bath Hamiltonian, and uh, once I did that, I sort of again, you know, uh, obtain a Schrödinger equation where now my total Hamiltonian is time dependent in this interaction picture, and and it has this form where we introduce these quantum noise operators, B of t. Uh, which are really just uh, you know um, linear combinations of of these um, bosonic modes uh, of the environment. Uh, they satisfy this you know, you know uh, commutation relation. That's sort of why we call them you know quantum noise operators, and they also of course annihilate the initial state. Uh, so let me just give you sort of a little bit uh, of a uh, interpretation of. Uh, this in you know, a way of writing down the Schrodinger equation. And to do so, let me simplify this thing uh, for a moment. And let me assume that uh, I only have one set of sort of environment modes. So I, I drop this sum over, over all these you know, path, uh, uh, different paths uh, here and just write down you know, one system, one environment. This environment has a continuum of modes, of course. Uh, which are these B omega. And you know, I can define now quantum noise operators by just taking sort of the Fourier transform of these modes. And so this is exactly the same equation that I wrote down before, except that now I only have sort of one set of environment modes and one jump operator. Okay, this Hamiltonian is sort of, you know, has a very sort of simple interpretation uh, because you see, at each, you know, it's it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and at each point in time, uh, your system interacts with a different, you know, bosonic operator. So T here is a, is a parameter that you know just labels which bosonic operator we're, we're talking about, and uh, you know these bosonic operators with different time parameters commute. And they're just uh, you know otherwise standard bosonic operators. One way to sort of interpret how this, what this, you know, uh, Schrodinger equation here does is by just looking at an example. Imagine your system is just a single two level system. And uh, now, you know, I look at, at my environment, which uh, I, you know, by, by you know, writing, by decomposing the, the environment in this, in, in this way, uh, it's just a collection of harmonic oscillators. You know, each of them has the uh, annihilation and creation operator B of T and B of T dagger. And, you know, at time T, uh, my system interacts with exactly the corresponding bosonic operator. So imagine, you know, let me discretize time. So now I have sort of small time bins, each of them containing a harmonic oscillator. They're initially all in the vacuum state because we assumed that the initial state is annihilated by every, you know, uh, annihilation operator uh, for each of these bosons. So each of these bosons is in the vacuum state. And if I sort of now integrate the Schrodinger equation in the first sort of time step, 
uh, my system interacts with the first node you know, because that's what appears here in the Schrodinger equation. It might, for example, you know, undergo like a transition from the excited to the ground state corresponding to uh, sort of the application of such a jump operator while the you know, corresponding bosonic mode gets excited. And then in the next time step, the system uh, interacts with the next uh, bosonic mode uh, and uh, and so on. Yeah? So this is uh, how the system interacts, you know, one by one with each of these bosonic modes uh, that make up this environment. And of course, when I, when I do this here, I, I, I cheat a little bit because, you know, in, in reality, uh, the system, of course, uh, is described by a wave function, which contains a superposition of many, many different, you know, uh, configurations of this environment. So you can have, a, a, you know, a branch of the wave function where the system, you know, did not excite any uh, you know, boson in this environment. So it stays in the vacuum and there is a corresponding conditional state of the system. There's a branch of the wave function where the system emitted, you know, a photon into, or a boson into, you know, exactly one of these uh, uh, harmonic oscillators, and there is a corresponding conditional wave function and so on. Okay, this is the total wave function. And uh, each of these, sorry, each of these, uh, um, uh, you know, conditional states here is essentially what we call a quantum trajectory. Uh, so uh, this is really the conditional state of the system, you know, conditioned on, uh, you know, finding the environment in a certain uh, configuration. And uh, what you get is, of course, if you have all these trajectories, if you have all these conditional states of the system, you know, given certain environment configurations, you can reconstruct uh, the system then, or you can obtain the system density operator uh, by simply mixing them together. It's equivalent to tracing over the environment degrees of freedom. I hear some, Zlatko, did you say something? Oh, yeah. um, maybe just a minor question, maybe two, two minor questions. One is, um, I suppose that is for an unraveling where you're looking at click detection or photon detection. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I will another... come to that in, in the next slide. Great. And then uh, I kind of tried to answer this, but a question from Miguel, the reason behind modeling the environment is a collection of baths rather than a single one. Uh, maybe I think this was a slide or two ago, if you'd like to just motivate that for us. Uh, well, it's, uh, I mean, the motivation is just if, if you have, uh, often if you write, if you have a, you know, physical system, uh, it's just, it behaves as if each of the constituent, uh, you know, couples to an individual bath. So if you write down a, you know, for example, uh, if you have an array of atoms and the atoms are separated by, you know, more than a wavelength of the light, then the coupling to the 3D radiation field, you know, effectively, uh, behaves as if each atom couples to its own you know radiate environment so it's it's just a way to uh you know obtain the master i mean you can obtain the master the master equation often if you just uh, you know couple the system to a joint collective environment if there is a collective environment and uh you know then in some limiting cases it looks like uh you have individual environments uh, uh, but it might also be that, you know, you really truly have individual environments because you have uh, a couple different, you know, subsystems to, to different environments, like superconducting qubits to transmission lines or things like that. Awesome. It's just a nice. model that you write down. Okay. Yeah, and thanks for the questions. Great. Feel free to keep posting them. Yeah, um, like, just interrupt me. That's great. Uh, okay, so this is kind of this... Uh, click, uh, you know, uh, photon number measurement unraveling that uh, Zlatko pointed out. Let me just before sort of, you know, moving on to other ones, let me just mention, of course, if you, uh, if you, you can also have, of, you can have multiple of these environments as we just discussed, but, you know, you can come up with a way to actually sample uh, these trajectories. So, uh, you know, one way of solving the master equation is actually to uh, you know generate trajectories or conditional states uh, that would correspond to um, 
uh, you know, measurement to, to certain configurations of the environments. And uh, if you sample them with, with the right probabilities, uh, you, you, you know, can obtain the master, the solution of the master equation by simply, you know, uh, solving for, by simply sampling these quantum trajectories. And one way of, you know, generating these samples of these quantum trajectories is by essentially simulating to, uh, uh, to monitor the environment with your classical computer, okay? So what you have is imagine you have your, uh, your state of your system at a certain time t, and you want to propagate it for an infinitesimal time t plus dt, uh, in which it sort of interacts with, you know, a set of, you know, different environments. So what you can do is for each of these environments, you do the following, you know, you let the system interact for an infinitesimal time with this environment, and then you measure whether this environment mode is in the vacuum or in the in the excited state. Uh, the probabilities for you know each of these two outcomes are you know you can calculate. They're just you know given by this formula. So you calculate the expectation value of sort of the jump operator dagger times the jump operator, you know, with respect to you know the current state of your trajectory, and uh, this gives you sort of a probability that you know your your environment mode will be excited in this infinitesimal time step and the probability that it won't be excited is sort of one minus this so what you do is you take a random number and you know sample according to these probabilities uh, and then decide whether you know you 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 simulated a measurement where the measurement outcome was you got a photon or an excitation or you know the one where you didn't get one and correspondingly you can show that the you know the state update that you have to perform. You know the, is 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 just an application of you know one of these two operators. Uh, you know in the case that you have a photon, you apply the jump operator, and in the case you don't have a photon, you apply a corresponding sort of evolution with a non-Hermitian operator. And you do this sequentially for each of these for each of these uh, channels, and that sort of tells you how to propagate uh, uh, the state of a trajectory. To, for a time step, and if you iterate that, you can you know build up a trajectory uh, for you know a, a whole sort of time segment. And uh, of course, yes. you have to also intersperse it with a coherent part of the evolution. Uh, but you know, in the way I set it up here, is I basically trotterized between coherent part and dissipative part. Could you tell us a little bit more about the trotterization? Like, does the order of the Ks matter? For instance, if some of the CJs are not commuting. Um, you know, if, if I choose a different ordering of the, of the or a different kind of trotterization order, sort of what I mean, uh, if you, I mean, in the end, in the end, uh, you know, you want to take the limit dt going to zero, and in that limit, sort of the trotterization here gives you higher order contribution, uh, so that shouldn't matter. Uh, of course, when you know, you should be careful, sort of, in, in, in the way if you have multiple output channels that you once you sort of you know measure the mode of one you update the state and you renormalize pro before you you sort of measure the output of the next mode uh, but if you do that then the order shouldn't matter okay so with this uh you can of course if you you know you can you know integrate iterate sort of this integration scheme many times and you get sort of a trajectory and then you repeat that several times you get many of these trajectories of course each trajectory might be different because the measurement outcomes that you simulate are different and so therefore you know this is a stochastic integrator if you want you get uh, you know uh, trajectories that are here indexed by this label k or labeled by the index k sorry <laughs> and uh, if you if you take the average over these trajectories uh, if you have you know enough trajectories you you recover your density operator because taking the average over the trajectories is equivalent to basically ignoring uh you know the measurement outcome which is equivalent to tracing over the degrees of freedom of the bar uh okay so this is you know this quantum trajectory method uh, but of course as latko already said before in principle nobody uh forces me to you know measure this environment you know degrees of freedom in in these in these FOC bases or in these number bases, I can go ahead and uh, measure these environment degrees of freedom in in any basis that I want. For instance, 
I can choose a quadrature of this harmonic oscillator, you know, specified by this variable phi. Uh, you know, there's a corresponding operator. It, this operator has has a complete set of of eigenstates, and uh, uh, you know, if if I measure in this eigenbasis of this you know harmonic oscillator uh, that the system just interacted with, then I will get different conditional states. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, you will get a different sort of propagation scheme for these conditional states. For instance, if I measure, you know, the position of this harmonic oscillator or one of the quadratures, then what you can show is, well, you know, the way you propagate your, your you know, your trajectory from one time to the next is you apply this propagator, which is now a sort of a random operator in the following sense. It has a deterministic element. Uh, which is which is just this part, uh, but it has a contribution uh, where uh, where there is this d xi, which uh, is you know a combination of something deterministic where you have the expectation value of things like the jump operator, but then also a, a term which is just you know a, a Wiener increment, so a random variable, a Gaussian random variable, which you know represents the fact that this this measurement here can uh, can have a continuum of outcomes and this continuum of outcomes uh, you know is in one-to-one -one correspondence to to this value of this Wiener increment that you sample here so if you if you simulate a measurement of this quadrature you now you basically calculate what's the probability for a given measurement outcome of this quadrature that's basically you know the measurement outcome is basically this xi and then you apply the corresponding stochastic propagator that Gives you the you know conditional state conditioned on uh, having you know this this specific measurement outcome of of your quadrature measurement. Okay, and of course you also have to intersperse uh, this evolution with with the coherent part of the evolution. And you again, uh, you know, if you repeat this many times, you get again the the density matrix out that solves the master equation, the same master equation uh, that we solved before with the other method. Uh, but now, of course, you get different, you know, trajectories. Uh, but sort of the point is, once you mix them together, you, know, you get the same master equation. Uh, what you can then, of course, I mean, I, I gave you two examples. One is you can measure the, you know, the occupation number in a Fock basis, or you can measure some quadratures. Of course, in principle, nobody forbids you from uh, measuring any arbitrary, you know, in any arbitrary, you know, uh, complete basis. Of, of each of these harmonic oscillators, you can do that and derive corresponding stochastic propagators, you know, uh, corresponding to whatever, you know, measurement or continuous measurement scheme that you do on each of these output channels. And uh, you will get an ensemble of trajectories that is again different, but once you mix them together, again, you get the solution of the master equation. That's kind of the point of this trajectory method. So let me just summarize in this thing. Uh, you know, how this would look like on a computer, right? You have your many body system. Let's assume you have a 1D chain of qubits and you want to solve a master equation that is maybe has some nearest neighbor interaction in your, uh, you know, system Hamiltonian, your coherent part. So you split the coherent part from the incoherent part in a cauterization and the incoherent part uh, now, you know, amounts to application of these stochastic uh, propagators that if your jump operator is local, then the stochastic propagators are local. But of course, for each of them, you have to draw a random number and you know choose uh, the right one. So there is a stochastic layer in your propagation. Then there is a deterministic layer, which implements your coherent part of the evolution. And then you make sort of one time step. And then you repeat the whole thing and you build up the state of a given quantum trajectory. And the point here is that you know, if I, you know, I, if you, if you choose different stochastic propagators, meaning that you choose to monitor your environment differently, then uh, the the trajectories that you will get out uh, will be different. Okay. Of course, the ensemble averages of linear observables over these trajectories will always be the same, because you know, once you mix these trajectories together, uh, they will uh, they will just you know. Give you the, the solution of the master equation 
The point that I want to make here is, of course, that ensemble averages of nonlinear quantities uh, over these trajectories uh, will be in general different for, you know, for different unraveling schemes. And uh, so the, the quantity that I'm most interested in, in for reasons that will you know, be obvious in a second is you know, the entanglement entropy in your trajectory. So imagine my, my system you know, that I'm, whose, whose dynamic I'm interested in it can be sort of you know, written in a bipartite uh, way. Um, so imagine it's just, yeah, Slatko. Yeah. Quick question, Hannes, and maybe you'll tell us more about this. Uh, the um, ensemble average for some observable, like the poly Z string or something, convert, uh, yeah. are the same. Yeah. Are the convergences, well, no, maybe my, my maybe my question doesn't even make good sense, but the convergences. No, I think your question, your question makes perfect maybe sense. It's anticipating. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's the, the uh, like expectation values of op operators, like, you know, some Pauli string is of course always the same, but the convergence in terms of the statistical convergence, how many trajectories did you have to run to uh, reduce the statistical error uh, below, uh, you know, your your accuracy goal that you want to have depends, of course, on how you unravel the mass equation, because that's one of the things that is sort of a nonlinear observable, like the 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 variance of the mean uh, is is something that you know changes if you change trajectory, uh, un change unraveling scheme. Sorry, that's right. That's true. Um, only if I have measurements, right? I think if if I only have I, how do I say this? If I only have unitary unraveling, um, maybe that maybe I'll leave that question for the end. But uh, okay, uh, okay. Let, let me come back to that. <laughs> okay, perfect. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's different uh, sort of nonlinear properties that you might be interested in. You know, one of them is for, you know variance of means and stuff. Uh, but the one that I'm I care about most uh, in this talk is the entanglement in a system that I can sort of split in two parts. And uh, what I mean by that is just, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in, in systems that are described by pure state, because in the end, I'm going to talk about trajectories, which are pure states. So it's very easy to define the entanglement in, in a trajectory or in a pure state. I simply take the entropy of the reduced density operator of one of the two subsystems. Uh, and I call this the, you know, this is the entanglement entropy of, of this state of the system or of the trajectory, if you want. And uh, what I'm then interested in uh, in the following will be something like the ensemble average over the entanglement entropy uh, over the, you know, for different trajectories. So imagine I have an ensemble of trajectories, which are just these states psi k. I can calculate the entanglement entropy. And I take the ensemble average over over these uh, you know trajectories or these ensemble of trajectories. This I you know call E bar, which is this ensemble average entanglement entropy. And you can immediately you know uh, make a few statements about this quantity. For one, you know you can bound it from above and below. And there is a lower bound, which is of course the entanglement of formation of the density operator that you know solves the master equation you cannot you know decompose uh, the density operator with you know and you know trajectories that have less entanglement than on average than the entanglement of formation is pretty much the definition of the entanglement of formation and you can also show that this thing is upper bounded by the minimum of the uh, entropy of the reduced density operator uh, of rho where rho is the solution of the master equation okay so there's a lower and an upper bound of this you know, uh, ensemble averaged entanglement entropy. And uh, the reason why I'm interested in this ent entanglement entropy is because uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the quantity that in a sense is a proxy for how hard it actually is to you know, represent these, uh, uh, these trajectories on a classical computer if I use something like you know, matrix product states you know, for a one-dimensional system, and this will be what I'm what I'm going to use in the following. So, if if I if my trajectories, if I use matrix product states to uh, represent my trajectories, then you know the the cost of you know representing these trajectories is given by the bond dimension of this of this matrix product states, which which I denote by chi here, 
and this bond dimension is sort of related to the entanglement uh, of this wave function. So if the entanglement is small, then uh, I can represent my trajectories efficiently. And if sort of I have an ensemble of trajectories where the entanglement is small, then I can I can solve my master equation by by these trajectory methods. Uh, so the question really is, can I choose my stochastic propagator, you know, such that this average entanglement entropy is as small as possible? So you know what I what I said before is this entang average entanglement entropy. This is a nonlinear quantity of my of my uh, trajectories. So it actually will depend on how I unravel the mass equation. So how I you know, monitor my environment. Different monitoring schemes will give me different trajectories that uh, you know have a different average uh, you know entanglement entropy. So the question is, can I choose between these monitoring schemes or between these stochastic propagation schemes uh, in such a way that uh, you know I make this entropy small and therefore my classical computation as efficient as possible. So this is, of course, a kind of tricky question because I mean it's not even clear what I mean when I say the average entanglement entropy is small, because it might be small at certain times during my time evolution and large during other times. So let me sort of you know uh, narrow down this question a little bit to make it more tractable, and instead ask the question: you know, given my trajectory at a certain time. Can I choose a stochastic propagator? Can I you know, decide to monitor my environment in a certain scheme such that the change rate uh, of the entanglement entropy on average is as small as possible? You know, that that's would be sort of you know one thing that it would help me to propagate the state at least for a small time uh, in such a way that you know, the cost of representing the state at the next time step is as low as possible. And uh, so, you know, I think that's that's a well-defined question that you can ask. Uh, and uh, so let me just, you know, look at a couple of these uh, unraveling schemes that, that, you know, we discussed before. You know, if you're given a trajectory in a pure state phi uh, and you, you choose to propagate your, your wave function, uh, by coupling it to these environments, then you can you can see that if you if you make you know if you monitor the environment in this in this photon number basis, so you check whether in a certain instance of time you get a click or no click. Oh, sorry. Then uh, your on average your entanglement entropy will uh, change you know according to this formula. So you can sort of work it out, kind of. Uh, slightly painful thing to to derive it uh, but you know there is a formula that just tells you well if if I monitor my environment according to this photon number measurement then my entanglement entropy will change on average according to this on the other hand you can you know change uh, you know the monitoring scheme sorry what's Glasser, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes can you hear me yeah Quick question. Sorry, what um, what uh, what is what do we mean by system? Oh, I see. Never mind. Maybe I see. It. Uh, you do have the trace of B. Okay, I was trying to figure out what do we mean yeah. by system A and B here, but maybe I see it now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to you have to specify before what you call A and what you call B, where you make your bipartition because it defines what you know you call entanglement, and this enters here in this formula by sort of you make your partial traces. And you have to decide, you know, what you trace out. So how how should I choose my A and B as a user of this? <laughs> as a well, uh, that's you know that's a little bit up to you. What we typically do in the in the in these algorithms that I present in you know in the later slides is uh, that we just you know take uh, A and B in a, in a one dimensional spin chain and just take half the system to be A, half the system to be B. Uh, but it's a good question whether you can sort of, you know, win by, by uh, you know, playing around with with what what you minimize here. I see. And just to, just so I follow a little bit better, if I take the example of a GHC state, mm -hmm. with uh, if I and then I guess if I partition A and B, that that's that has maximal entropy, right? Uh, 
Uh, no, a GHC state actually has not that much entropy. If you partition it, it's just one bit. It's one it's, bit. Uh, because the reduced density matrix is just, uh, you know, has two non-zero eigenvalues only. It's just, it's very simple reduced density matrix. Okay, so then it catches the fact that it's, you know, only two basis states or it's stabilizer yeah. is very yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, now, of course, you can evaluate the same, you know, thing if you look at uh, other monitoring scheme, like imagine you monitor now some quadrature, uh, you know, specified by this phi, then uh, you can also work out how would the entanglement entropy change on average uh, if I do this. And this is kind of the formula, okay? It's again, a slightly ugly formula, but you know, you can, given your state, Given your jump operators, given you know phi, which specifies your monitoring scheme, you can just you know work out what would be the change rate on average without even doing the samples, right? You can just calculate it, and uh, you know that's for these two type of unraveling schemes. One thing that we showed is in this paper, and I have to refer you here to the supplementary material of this thing, is that if you optimize over, you know all sort of different types of measurements that you can do on a sort of single bosonic mode that the minimum is either achieved you know with this you know number unraveling or with one of these quadrature unraveling it's kind of an interesting result because you can use this now to come up with uh, you know what we call a greedy algorithm so imagine the following situation so you have like your, your trajectory at a certain time t right here which has a certain entanglement E of T, and you want to propagate it, you know, for some small time step T plus DT, and you want to propagate it in such a way that you know the expected entanglement after this propagation step is as small as possible. So imagine you now compare two of these propagation schemes, like you know the the number measurements or the homodyne or quadrature measurement. Uh, and you know, imagine this sort of a pictorial representation of what it would be. Imagine in one case, you you know, your trajectories, uh, you know, would you know give rise to a change of entanglement according to this. So these dashed lines would should represent possible trajectories. So on average, you would you know go up here with entanglement if you use this type of stochastic propagator. Uh, if you use the other type of stochastic propagator you would get different trajectories that maybe have a different type of entanglement. And uh, so you would see that, okay, on average, the entanglement here on, with this green propagator is, is smaller. So, you know, I can, you know, make a choice and say, let me propagate my states with the green propagator because on average, I get a smaller entanglement afterwards. Once I do, once I decide, I commit to the green propagator, I have to, of course, Take a sample from these green ones probabilistically, and it might you know I cannot really pick which one. I just have to you know sample, and then I just um, randomly will you know uh, have to take one. And this is my state at the next time step, and then I can iterate the whole game. I can again choose: is the green one you know likely better, or is the is the gray one likely better? Let me pick the better one, and uh, you know sample according to that one so this will give you sort of a greedy algorithm in the following sense that's exactly what i what i described so what you should do if you have your state at a certain time t uh, you want to propagate is you know for each of these jump operators that you have you calculate you know what in, by evaluating these formulas that we had before you calculate the expected change in your entanglement uh, if you do a number unraveling without actually doing sampling, just calculate this expected change rate, calculate the expected change rate for this, you know, homodyne unraveling or, you know, corresponding to quadrature measurements and, you know, pick the one that, you know, you like more because it's it's lower and then choose accordingly, a, 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 you know, a stochastic propagator and propagate uh, accordingly the, the wave function. This gives you a greedy algorithm. And the point is that if you're, if your you know, wave function here is given in terms of a matrix product state, then uh, the cost of actually 
evaluating these functions here or evaluating these uh, these uh, these derivatives is is the same uh, or is smaller actually than the cost of you know uh, doing the the TBD update of your of your matrix product state. So the cost of just doing the standard coherent part of the evolution is is more than just optimizing over over this you know choice of of stochastic propagators for the incoherent part of evolution, which is nice uh, because it means that you can do this uh, efficiently or at least you don't you know incur additional cost or significant additional cost on top of you know what you already have to pay to just propagate uh, the the coherent part of the dynamics. Uh, okay, so let me just give you an example. It is essentially the example that Slatko uh, mentioned before. Uh, quick, quick. Is like a uh, what was chi? Yeah, you yeah. think you said this. What sets chi? Oh, um, chi? Chi is the bond dimension of the matrix product state. Sorry, I should have I should have said that again. Uh -huh. Chi is the bond dimension of the matrix product state, and D is the locally Hilbert space dimension of your of your. I don't know if 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 you have a chain of qubits, D is two. Uh-huh. 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 Oh, okay. Great. Great. And I guess they have some scaling with, with the number of sites or something like that. Yeah, of course. Then I mean this is just for, for a single site. And you know, if you have M jump operators, you might apply it by M, but mm. that's uh, it, it, it's the same for the TBD update. You have to do it for each pair of sites. Mm. Uh, okay, so now let me just give you a very sort of simple example, uh, which is this uh, base state. Imagine I have a system that I prepare in like two two qubits, you know, one I call A and one I call B, uh, and I prepare them in the base state, and I just let them evolve under a master equation where my jump operator is this uh, projector onto the, you know, one state of the qubit. So this is the master equation, uh, sort of a dephasing channel for each of these uh, qubits and uh, for this master equation I can exactly calculate the entanglement of formation and then I can calculate what's my ensemble average entanglement if I always you know do my number measurement in my environment so if I get unravelings according to the number measurement uh, so this will always be of course larger than entanglement of formation but this is the blue line here it's, it's sort of you know starts out at zero because in both cases uh, just uh, you know you're, you're, you just start out with the same state and in the end both the entanglement of formation and uh, the ensemble average entanglement entropy is zero uh, if you if you instead of uh, measuring uh, unraveling the system according to number measurements of your of your photons in your environment if you instead make a homodyne measurement or measure these quadratures, then uh, you see this curve here. So uh, this is a, you, know, you see obviously that, I mean, in both cases, you solve the same master equation, but they both have different, you know, average entanglement entropies, the different ensembles. So that's like the simplest example that, that where you can see that it's actually different. And, uh, what what you get now if you use this greedy algorithm that I just introduced on the previous slide is you know at each instance of time you know you have a certain you know state of your trajectory and you choose well do I want to do now a number measurement or a homodyne measurement what's better for my entanglement uh, and then what you get is this green line so initially uh, you know you get the same curve as the red line. Uh, meaning that the best measurement uh, initially, obviously, is is the homodyne measurement. You can see the probability that you that your stochastic propagator picks a homodyne measurement in the beginning is very large, so it follows this line. But then after a while, you you know your state, you get an ensemble of states where, for some of them, it will be better to actually uh, switch over and uh, you know make make number measurements. To propagate them further, uh, because you know the average entanglement is lower, and you can see that this is happening around here, uh, where you know your, the probability that you actually, uh, you know, that this greedy algorithm tells you to use number measurements sort of takes over. 
And you can see that indeed your entanglement is smaller than in both of these cases. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, since it's a greedy algorithm, you cannot uh, you cannot guarantee that you know this ensemble average entanglement is always small the smallest possible. Uh, and and you can see this already here in this simple example that on long times, uh, you know, you would have been better off to pick this number measurement in the beginning because uh, at long times it, it will lead to sort of smaller entanglement if you pick sort of homodyne measurements in the beginning because it seems locally to be the better choice on the long run you actually you actually have to pay the price okay another example which is maybe a little bit more interesting or you know is is uh, uh, sort of what we call an open random brownian circuit the idea here is you have a master equation which is induced, which has a coherent part and the dissipative part as always, but the coherent part is simply uh, a, a nearest neighbor interaction between uh, you know, two qubits on a one dimensional chain uh, uh, with sort of random two qubit interactions at each instance of time. So, you know, this G, K, L is just, uh, they're uncorrelated random Gaussian numbers. So, uh, yeah, you just have randomly at each, you have XX interactions, XY interactions, uh, YZ interactions, and so on between nearest neighbor spins with strength, which, you know, with uh, interaction strengths that are, are sort of random. Uh, this sort of mimics, you know, uh, the continuous version of, uh, you know, a random circuit. Okay, random circuit is just a discrete set of random nearest neighbor gates in, in such an architecture. This is sort of the continuous time analog on of, of a random circuit. And as, as jump operators, we just assume that each qubit uh, has a sort of dephasing channel. And now uh, you can uh, do a little bit of math and for example, look at this homodyne uh, propagator, which is just you know the one that you get when you make quadrature measurements of your environment. The quadrature measurement, you know, remember it's specified by uh, by this this angle here phi, which tells you which quadrature you measure, uh, you can write down this. You can rewrite this propagator in the following form, uh, where it has sort of a, a non-unitary part and a unitary part. Uh, you know, depending on on phi and on sort of which quadrature you monitor. Uh, the unitary part here is kind of trivial because you know when you apply this you know stochastic propagator you can sort of think about absorbing this unitary part in in sort of the, the random brownian circuit that anyways has some sort of unitary uh, dynamics uh, in it so you can always absorb this in the coherent part of your of your of your master equation uh, and then you're left with this sort of non-unitary part of your stochastic propagator and interestingly, you can see here that um, you know changing changing which quadrature you measure here, but changing phi uh, while keeping gamma fixed, which is sort of the dephasing rate, is the same as actually uh, keeping phi fixed and changing gamma. Okay, it's the same as you know just pretending to measure always the same quadrature, but increasing the dephasing strengths or changing the dephasing strengths. So in that sense, you know, changing the measurement at a fixed rate uh, in this type of circuit is the same as changing the rate uh, uh, at, uh, at the fixed for a fixed measurement setting. Okay, and why is this interesting? This is interesting because it connects to some sort of, uh, to a sort of whole bulk of literature where people uh, recently started to look at this, you know, measurement induced phase transitions where you know they actually you know, one of the settings that you know one considers there is really you just monitor your environment with a fixed monitoring scheme and uh, if you turn up sort of the the dephasing rate or, or the monitoring rate then you will have a transition between trajectories that whose entanglement obeys a volume law so where the entanglement uh, grows uh, proportional to the subsystem size uh, at sort of small uh, noise rate. Uh, and there's a transition to trajectory to a phase where the trajectories have area law entanglement entropy, 
meaning that the entanglement entropy in each trajectory saturates as a function of subsystem size uh, if your noise rate is, is very large. So this is kind of well established in the literature. There's a critical value for this gamma. And uh, what we what we see here is that you know we can have another axis here, which is you know uh, instead of just fixing how we monitor the environment, we can change how we monitor the environment. And uh, then what happens is because we know that changing how we monitor the environment is the same as essentially changing the measurement rate at the fixed you know setting of your monitoring scheme, uh, we will we will obtain this type of phase diagram where you know you have an area law phase and a volume law phase here. And the interesting point here is as long as your physically, you know, the phasing rate gamma is above this critical uh, value, you will have, depending on how you measure the environment, purely how you measure the environment, you will have a transition between trajectories that obey an area law and are therefore efficiently representable via matrix product states and trajectories uh, where that have a volume law in their entanglement entropy and are therefore not efficiently representable by a matrix product set. So this means that you can unravel the same master equation at the fixed gamma in different ways. And it really makes a qualitative difference in, in sort of how easy it is to uh, represent the corresponding trajectories on a classical computer. In a classical computer, what you want to make sure is that, of course, you are unraveling uh, according to such a, a, a stochastic propagator that keeps your trajectories in the area law. And you know, for this example of this open random Brownian circuit, we know that there is indeed this area law phase, and we can now go ahead and check. I mean, we can just numerically, you know, uh, confirm that indeed, if we have this type of unraveling, we have an area law phase. We take this type of unraveling, we have this volume law phase. Uh, which is sort of indicated here as this uh, average entanglement entropy. And we can then also show that if we use uh, wait, the media algorithm. A little bit slower. Yeah. So uh, what's Na? Uh, Na is the number of atoms. Oh, and... I see. Sorry. We have, we, what we have here is just a chain of, of N atoms, which is, I think, for this simulation was 16. Uh, and uh, we, Na is just the number of atoms in, in, in the partition A. Okay, for a fixed length okay. chain. For a fixed length chain, yeah. And uh, what you see here is, for example, uh, if you this is just calculating the entropy, entanglement entropy at different partitions. So you know, if you take two atoms, you know, the entanglement entropy is this. If you take more, it sort of saturates. It doesn't change anymore. Of course, if you take all the atoms in your partition A, the entanglement is zero again. So this is the entanglement profile in your trajectory on average. And, uh, uh, and, and so really this depends. is so yeah. this is depends. I mean, the different line lines correspond to different unraveling schemes, and they're actually mm -hmm. sort of evaluated in this in the steady state. You know, once you propagate the system long enough, such that you know on the the the, the system undergoes uh, is in the steady state. So you can see that you know this this unraveling scheme clearly gives you an area law because the entanglement here is just proportional to the subsystem size at least as long as your subsystem size is sort of smaller than half of the total system then it's of course uh, this is just this page curve uh, but uh, you know this just these different lines basically should il illustrate that indeed you you have this transition here from this area law trajectories to these volume law trajectories mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what it also should illustrate uh, is that if you now use this greedy algorithm that I introduced before, I mean, for this example, we know how to get the area law trajectories, but if you wouldn't know and you would just use the greedy algorithm, it would find unravelings that have an area law as sort of indicate, this is sort of the green line is what the greedy algorithm uh, would give you. Okay, so that's encouraging to see that, you know, if you don't know anything about the, the uh, this phase. I mean, if there is an area law phase, at least you know we have an example where the greedy algorithm can find it. And uh, okay, yeah. Quick question for well, actually, I'm not so sure how quick this one is, but question from Luke uh, Govia. Thanks, Luke. 
Um, in all of these examples and in the work, how does the finite trajectory sampling error propagate in this greedy evolution strategy? In other words, since you're only sampling a finite number of trajectories, uh, like a hundred or a thousand um, trajectories. We're, we're sampling here, of course, a finite number of trajectories. The sampling error here, I think, is smaller. Like, I mean, it depends on which quantity you want to evaluate here. We evaluate the mean entanglement entropy. And you, we take the, you know, we, we sample enough such that the error is below sort of, you know, this line thickness. But uh, it depends, in, in general, it depends on which quantity you want to, uh, you know, measure in uh, which quant, which, what's the quantity you're interested in. I mean, in the end, you're interested in, in observables of your system that you could get from the master equation. And, uh, you know, if you change uh, unraveling schemes, the the the, the variance uh, of this observ of the mean value of these observables can change, which means that the the number of uh, samples that you need changes. But you know, in the end, the the the, the number of samples you, know, you can always reduce the 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 statistical error just by increasing the number of samples and the error will go down the error of the mean would just go down uh with you know proportional to the sample size squared sample number squared and uh so it's just a polynomial overhead in terms of of sampling if you of course if you here you can gain much more because if you need to represent sort of the difference between in in terms of computational cost when you go from area law trajectories to volume law trajectories is sort of exponential right if you if if you, this the, the cost of representing these trajectories is exponentially larger than the cost of representing these trajectories so uh, i don't have sort of the data here that it, you know compares the statistical noise of certain observables in these trajectories versus these trajectories um, i think they're comparable but you know if you, you just need a polynomial a polynomially more numbers of trajectories in the worst case to get the same statistical accuracy uh whereas sort of the computational cost of representing the trajectories um, differs here by sort of an exponential amount so in that sense i think it, it makes sense to to optimize for you know entanglement versus you could also go ahead and optimize for you know statistically uh so sample complexity and uh, uh but that's i think uh you know for these many body systems um, you know may, may, maybe maybe uh, the the thing that you worry less mm -hmm. i see yeah, in other words sampling is cheap representing the status exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly okay well uh well, with this, I'm pretty much uh, already at the end. This is just a different representation of the same data. So we we check that this also, uh, you know, holds if we go to larger and larger system size. So this is the same for spin chains up to 80 qubits. And we make a cut in the middle. And you see that the middle, the entanglement in the middle cut doesn't grow anymore if you increase your system size uh, for, you know, the optimal trajectory here and the one that the greedy algorithm finds whereas you know from some trajectories that you get from here uh your average entanglement just you know grows with system size and this is sort of another confirmation that you see you're using about. tensor networks on all of these data sets we are using just uh, matrix product states to to get this data yeah. okay with this i'm i ended my talk and pretty much uh, out of time i would just like to acknowledge here uh tatiana who really uh did the, the bulk of the work that I've presented here. Uh, so just to summarize, what we did is we developed some sort of adaptive stochastic propagator uh, where we use a novel sort of way to, you know, uh, choose the stochastic propagator by, you know, minimizing the expected entanglement. Uh, we showed that sort of at least in examples where we know that an area law exists, uh, this, you know, adaptive stochastic propagator can find area law unravelings. Uh, what I think would be nice and what we didn't do yet is uh, to, uh, you know, optimize the unraveling in a sort of more complicated way. So right now, if we have, you know, multiple uh, you know, output channels, 
we optimize the measurement of each, out, each output channel individually uh, to minimize the entanglement that remains in the system. Uh, but in principle, you could do much more powerful things and make collective measurements across different output channels. And you, if you do that, you could imagine that you know you could even you know win more by taking out more of the entanglement of the system and making the the, the trajectory even more efficiently representable. So that's something we're, we're trying to work out now. Uh, we also are working on sort of comparison with other methods to uh, simulate uh, open quantum anybody systems, like for example, you know, just using you know uh, matrix product operators to represent the density matrix and just solve the mass equation. And uh, you know, you can come up with examples where the matrix product operator bond dimension, you know, blows up exponentially while the trajectories uh, uh, have a finite bond dimension. So I think at least you know we know there are some examples where you know the trajectory method uh, will beat these uh, matrix product operator methods. But of course, we didn't do an exhaustive study uh, yet. Uh, but so that's that's things that we would like to do along these lines. Okay, with this. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Hannes. This was really elegant. Really enjoyed it. Um, folks, this is a great time to post your final questions as Hannes comes to do the final few minutes here. Uh, oh, by the way, before I even start with questions, I'll relay from the chat that a lot of people said very clear and excellent talk. Thank you a lot. Um, one of the questions you actually had, which was the non-local measurements, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. The other one is, what are other possible unravelings besides point process and homo-heterodyne? Are there other, actually you didn't do heterodyne, but are there other schemes uh, or unravelings that one could look at? Um, yeah, in principle, I think, you know, you can come up with sort of a whole world of stochastic integrators you know you you know you can come up with stochastic integrators that maybe don't even correspond to measurements of an output channel uh, and uh, you can ask the same question of whether you can uh, optimize uh, over those i'm not i'm not sure you know if, if I, I have no feeling for some of them whether they would be uh, you know easier or uh, whether they would allow such an optimization or not, uh, we just chose to use this, you know, simple, you know, uh, single environment mode measurement unravelings uh, because it allowed us to, you know, analytically calculate expressions like, you know, the expected change rate of the entanglement, which is sort of uh, makes it makes it uh, makes it useful. Uh, but I, I mean that I mean there's an excellent question and. It's one thing that we're, we're, we're working on right now to just see whether we can uh, expand mm -hmm. extend this to other unraveling schemes. So mostly yeah. non-local ones. I think non-local ones are actually the most, you know, promising ones where you, where yeah. you, you know, use the jump operator. That uh, if you have a non-local jump operator, it's kind it's kind of obvious that I mean it could also increase entanglement, but. Uh, if you yeah, use it uh, wisely, English. if you use it wisely, then you can maybe take out quite a bit. Interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. I guess I'll need to get an intuition. Maybe maybe you have an intuition for that. If not, uh, oh. <laughs> no, I don't really have an intuition. I, we have a couple of you know toy examples where we see that uh, if you do a non-local. Uh, unraveling then uh, you get sort of uh, less entangled trajectories but i don't, didn't really develop an intuition yet sort of you know when and why this is possible have you thought about the limit like what is the fundamental ultimate limit if i allow you to do any measurement even if it's like a, a, P, a generalized povm that could extract every single observable I mean, in the system shot <laughs> that's a very interesting question i mean if you allow me to be very very general and you know just even don't do like continuous time measurements but maybe you know collect the environment degrees of freedom and keep them coherently and then make later measurements if i have multiple of these environment modes available then i think the ultimate limit is just the entanglement of formation 
but if there is, uh, if you, if you if you restrict yourself and you always, you know, want to measure all environment modes instantaneously because you don't want to keep them, then it's an interesting question. What's what's uh, what's the limit here? Yeah, and I I, I don't know. Right. Yeah, um, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, I guess because the question is, you know, we showed those charts where you optimize with the greedy algorithm over point process and this homodyne measurement. Mm -hmm. And I would wonder what's the ultimate, because it almost sounds like, to me, the ultimate sounds like an example of circuit cutting, right? Where basically you can cut up your circuit in such a way that you only have single qubits and they're completely decoupled and they're all independent. Right? This is not a great analogy, maybe. We have to think about it more. But then at an exponential overhead in classical post-processing or maybe in sampling or something like that, you can reconstruct the full quantum evolution. Um, so you can always take a quantum circuit and simulate it classically, not classically, sorry, you can simulate it with smaller pieces of quantum systems, which kind of sounds like reducing the entanglement entropy to me by essentially having independent fragments, but then recombining the information from those fragments generally comes with an exponential overhead. So maybe there's some relationship, not sure. Yeah, it could be. I think I think that's sort of going even beyond, and what you just said goes even beyond sort of the framework that we have in mind. But yeah, maybe maybe one one should think about it. Yeah. Great, awesome. Um, giving you ideas here uh, <laughs> on the on the uh, do, you, do we have an interpretation of the EOQT? Like, if you did that in an actual experiment, uh, like how how do I think about what that? does or accomplishes so, or what is it doing to the system in terms of more conceptual level rather than than this uh... well in an actual experiment i'm not sure if it's really uh, a great uh, thing to think about this in an experimental context because um i mean you can you can you could in principle do this in an experiment and adapt your monitoring scheme uh you know you know given your your measurement record that you have in the past uh, and uh, you could in principle do this uh, but you you would never be able to measure something like the entanglement in your trajectory because it would be exponentially hard to you know generate the same trajectory again uh, and uh, and perform any sort of meaningful measurement that uh, would allow you to extract entanglement. I think in the experiment, sort of the, the interesting question would be the opposite. Actually, you could flip it around and uh, uh, say, well, what kind of monitoring scheme in the environment should I do such that uh, the entanglement is, is maximum in my system? And I think people have studied this and, uh, uh, and you know, developed ways to keep your entanglement alive in your system if you if you sort of measure the environment in such a way that you don't leak any information about about your system into the environment and in that way keep it keep the entanglement in the system which you know if you have control over the environment if you can measure it uh might be a way to to protect your system yeah. similar in spirit to you know what you did with your you know reversal of quantum jumps awesome that's a good one to think about and um, since we're almost 15 minutes over, last question from Mansoor. He asked, uh, the initial state he considered was already entangled in the, the GHD state, uh, and it was evolving to be not entangled. I guess he was interested in understanding yeah. that part a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's, to just, uh, that's just, that's uh, just, I mean, one of, like, because it's a toy example, we wanted to take out the Hamiltonian part of the evolution, just a toy example where you just have, you know, uh incoherent part therefore if you want to have any entanglement you want to start with an entangled state and just see how the entanglement decays and uh, so that's indeed what happens for this for this uh type state uh, example so the entanglement will decay it will decay at different speeds uh you know corresponding like for different environments and uh, monitoring schemes and that's what you see i mean whether the fact whether you start in an entangled state or in a product state in general is really kind of irrelevant for for you know this method that i just presented it's it just make toy example easier to understand awesome hannes um any final words before we close here uh well, 
Um, I'm not sure if I have final words. Thanks a lot for organizing it. And you know, hopefully we meet again soon in person. Yes, yes, always a terrific pleasure. Folks, Hannes, thank you very much for making all the different time zones from, uh, I think we had Taiwan to, to Bulgaria, Europe, uh, Austria, New York, and California. So pretty much the, the, almost all the globe. It's been a real pleasure and privilege to have you here on the 99th Kiskit Seminar series. You've got lots of nice comments and, and thanks in the chat. Uh, and with that, this talk will stay recorded so you guys can go back and rewatch it. You can only ask questions live. And next time, tune in for a very special 100th seminar and we'll maybe do some extra things around it and we'll announce that next week. So stay tuned. Hannes, it's been a pleasure, folks. Always love to see you here. With that, see you next week. Bye-bye.